Hello. For tonight's grisly tale, I'm going to read you a story from Fearsome Tales for Fiendish Kids. These are cautionary tales that I wrote for lovers of Squeam. Tonight's story is called Jack in a Box. There's a joke shop in Great Pessaries, sells ventriloquist accessories, like tongues and arms and eyeballs if they've got them. But they also sell a dummy that's so lifelike it's not funny, because it speaks without a hand stuck up its bottom. The Honourable Jack Delaunay de Havilland de Tro called Jack by those who could get a word in edgeways, was a privileged child with an undeserved title. He lived in a huge mansion in the rarefied rural air of Hampshire, just outside Great Pessaries, a town of considerable beauty, but for the influx of newly wealthy with their mobile phones and disposable wives. Jack's parents were landed gentry, the Lord and Lady Delaunay de Havilland de Tro, whose lives were devoted to balls and banquets and charity functions. They hobnob with the rich and famous, transforming their gardens into tented disco halls or polo pitches or outdoor art galleries, depending on which particular good cause they were supporting that week. They were social butterflies, passing their days in a never-ending twitter of small talk, laughing with royalty, consoling the poor, but never short of a word or a conversation for whomsoever should step through their front door. Living with his parents, Jack had picked up their habits, talking incessantly about nothing of interest, chattering inanely to anyone who'd listen. In short, a boy who loved the sound of his own voice and thought that everyone was spellbound by what he had to say. The family were at breakfast one day discussing Jack's sister's birthday party. So I said to the vicar, trilled Lady de Trow, sipping on her glass of champagne and stuffing her face with smoked salmon toast, I said to him, I said, the prize... You know, Andrew, interrupted Jack, the boy with the father with the wig and the mother with the full snow made of plastic. I'm talking, said Jack's mother. Well, Andrew says that if you eat chicken in your hands, it tastes like chicken, but if you eat it off a plate, it doesn't. Your mother is talking, boomed Lord de Trove from the far end of the table. I think I prefer it to taste like chicken, because I really love chicken, especially when it's cooked. I mean, I, I couldn't eat it if its skin was still cold and full of feathers. Jack! Be quiet, roared his father. Speak when you're spoken to. Did I tell you that I'm in the football team? I said, speak when you're spoken to. Well, you are speaking to me, explained Jack. They put me in as a striker. His mother howled. I'm trying to have a conversation. Well, I hope I score a hundred goals, because then I'll beat the school record. Shut up, roared his father. The record's 99. It would have been 100, but the referee didn't give a penalty in the match against St Dunstan's, apparently. I don't know. I wasn't there. It was in 1919. I've got a Veruca. Look. And he took off his shoe and put his foot on the table. Lord de Trow brandished his rolled-up newspaper like a club. Don't interrupt your mother when she's talking, he growled. Right, my dear. Please continue. Jack sat in silence while his mother attempted to carry on. Well, I, I can't remember what I was saying now, she muttered. Uh, you were talking about Rosie's birthday party, said Jack. Silence! glowered his father. Well, I was only trying to help, sulked Jack. Can't anyone say anything around here without getting their head bitten off? Oh, oh, yes, restarted Lady de Trode. The vicar, yes. I was telling him how expensive it is these days, so it's really painful, this Veruca. Are you sure you don't want to look? Jack's father exploded out of his chair and grabbed his son by the scruff of his neck. Out you go, he ordered. You can come back in when you've learned not to interrupt grown-up conversations. Jack was bundled out of the room into the hall, where his sister, Rosie, was sitting at the foot of the stairs, 
dressing her favourite doll. I am so sorry, apologised Lord de Trow to his wife as he went back into the dining room. That boy needs to learn some manners. Now, you were saying... They're talking about my birthday party, said Rosie, as her father shut the door. I'm not allowed in. I've got a Veruca, said Jack. Have a sniff. Jack never listened to a word anyone said. It didn't matter who was speaking. He'd butt across their conversation without turning a hair. Once he interrupted the Queen while she was in diplomatic conference with the Nigerian ambassador. Hey, basketball's brill! You'd love slam dunking, he shouted at the top of his voice. Uh, you could sit on Prince Philip's shoulders. Oh, no, no, actually, you wouldn't need to bother, would you? Because you're tall enough already, aren't you, your... Highness, the Queen was not amused, and turned away only to find Jack's sockless foot plonked in her lap. Do you want to see my Veruca? Something had to be done. His conversation was banal, his interruptions intolerable. He needed to be taught a very sharp lesson. Lord de Trow decided that Rosie should have a children's entertainer for her birthday party, but Lady de Trow didn't know how to find one. So she rang up her close friend, the Contessa di Fuengarola, and asked her advice. Darling, purred the Contessa down the phone, there is only one children's entertainer, don't you know? His name is Mr. Frankenstein. Well, he sounds horrible, said Lady de Trow. Oh, the children love him. He is a very ventriloquist, yes? A very good ventriloquist. That is what I say, darling. But, well, how do I get in touch with him, then? asked Jack's mother. You don't, replied the Contessa. He gets in touch with you. Well, that's a bit strange, isn't it? questioned Lady de Trow. I mean, how can he possibly know when I need him? He knows said the Contessa. The letterbox rattled in the hall. Uh, hold on one moment, requested Lady de Trow, placing the receiver on the table and scurrying into the hall to retrieve the letter. Seconds later, the Contessa de Fuengarola heard Lady de Trow gasp and pick up the phone in a hurry. Well, you'll never believe this, said Lady de Trow, but a card has just come through my letterbox. From Mr. Frankenstein, chuckled the Contessa. Well, how did you know? He doesn't miss a trick, darling. He wants the job. Yes, but should I let him have it? Can you stop him? laughed the Contessa. What do you mean? said Lady de Trow. Well, now that he's heard about Jack, explained the Contessa mysteriously. What? Must go, darling, chimed her friend. My jacuzzi is getting cold. Adios. Lady de Trow was left standing with the dead phone in her hand and Mr. Frankenstein's business card in the other. Mr. Frankenstein, children's entertainer, ventriloquism a speciality. Marvel at my lifelike dummies. You'll believe they're real when you see them walk and talk. I also do conjuring and balloon shapes, if you're sad enough to be impressed by that stuff. Reasonable rates for big parties of noisy children. At the bottom was a personal note to Lady de Trow. I'm so looking forward to meeting Rosie and Jack. I've heard so much about him. I shall be there on Saturday at three o'clock. Yours, Mr. Frankenstein. P.S. Please ensure that the lock on the sitting room door is in full working order, as I insist on complete privacy during a performance. The party was in full swing when Mr. Frankenstein arrived. Hordes of five-year-old girls ran screaming through the huge, empty corridors of the house, playing hide the thimble. Jack was bored with Rosie's friends, and was lurking on his own in the sitting room when the doorbell rang. "'You must be Jack,' said Mr. Frankenstein, as the boy opened the door. "'And you must be Mr. Frankenstein,' said Jack, taking a good look at the tall, grey-haired man on the doorstep. 
He didn't look a bit like a children's entertainer, more like an undertaker in a western. Trim, thin and hollow-cheeked, a hook nose and little tufts of hair over his ears, like rabbit's tails. What's that in your eye? he asked bluntly. A monocle, said the entertainer. May I come in? Jack opened the door wide to let Mr. Frankenstein and his boxes of tricks through, just as Lady de Trow ran into the hall with her daughter's screeching party in tow. I'm so sorry I wasn't here to greet you, she panted. We lost one of the girls in the attic. Is there anything... What's in that box? butted in Jack. Shh, snapped his mother. I'm talking, Jack. Don't be so ru... It looks like a coffin. Don't interrupt. Do you use dead rabbits in your act? Quiet, hissed his mother, wringing her hands with embarrassment. That's my dummy, explained Mr. Frankenstein. Perhaps you'd like to help me set up, Jack. Would you like to meet the birthday girl first? asked Lady de Tro, forcing a smile. She pushed her daughter forward. Rosie, this is Mr. Let's go, shouted Jack, cutting his mother dead and setting off for the sitting room. Mr. Frankenstein apologised to Rosie for leaving so hastily and promised to see her later. He followed the rude boy through the crowd of leaping girls and stopped when he reached the doorway. Wait out here, he said, and I'll call for you in a minute. Are you a good conjurer? said Jack, slamming the sitting room door on Rosie and her friends in the middle of Mr. Frankenstein's sentence. Only I once saw a conjurer who was pathetic. You're not pathetic, are you? Am I going to guess how you do all your tricks? I'm a ven ventriloquist, yes, I know, but you do tricks as well. A few, said Mr. Frankenstein. Why are you bald? asked Jack. You'd look much younger if you had hair. Why have you let it fall out? I've got a veruca. Bet you couldn't magic that away. Mr. Frankenstein laughed. What's so funny? asked Jack. Have you just thought of a joke? I know a joke about a wide-mouthed frog, but it's not suitable for Rosie and her friends. I think they're boring. Don't you ever stop talking? No. Why? Don't you like what I'm saying? Do you want me to talk about something else? Swifts can't stand up, you know. They fly all their lives. If they landed, their legs would snap because they're so weak and thin. Mr. Frankenstein was waiting to speak. I meant, you're very bad at interrupting. Well, I thought I was rather good at it, actually. Yes, I can see that, said Mr. Frankenstein, frankly. You know, you'd make an excellent ventriloquist dummy, Jack. Never quiet, always shouting, never listening to a thing that the ventriloquist says. Sorry, said Jack distractedly. Were you talking to me? I'm going to get a motorbike when I'm 16 and start driving lessons before I'm 17 so I can take my test on my birthday. Have you got a car? I bet it's a small one. My father's got six. Mr. Frankenstein's ears burned from Jack's tirade of senseless words. His cold eye twitched behind his monocle and his right hand jerked towards the boy's gabbling throat. But he caught himself just in time. Give me a hand with the box, he said, as he placed the oak coffin on the coffee table and started to unscrew the lid. As he did so, Jack heard a tiny plaintive voice cry out, Help! Let me out! It's dark in here! That's you, isn't it? said Jack. I'm cold, so cold, whimpered the voice. Is it? replied Mr. Frankenstein, sliding off the lid to reveal a pint-sized wooden dummy with a leather face. At least it looked like leather. Jack poked it on the cheek to check that it wasn't skin. Ow! squeaked the dummy. That hurt! Jack was so startled that he leapt backwards from the box and fell over Mr. Frankenstein's feet. Its lips moved, he exclaimed kneeling up and peering into the box again. The dummy's eyes blinked back at him. Its wrinkled face was alive. Pick me up, it squeaked. How are you doing that? gasped Jack, checking to see if Mr. Frankenstein's lips were moving, which they weren't. Clever little devil, isn't he? said Mr. Frankenstein admiringly. And all my own work. Suddenly, the dummy sprang forward in its box and grabbed Jack's ears. Pick me up, it screamed, wrenching a tuft of Jack's hair clean out of his head. 
Up close, the dummy's teeth looked like sharp sticks. Its gums and lips were brown and weathered like an old shoe. Jack had seen something like this before in a book about a head-shrinking tribe in New Guinea. Get off me, he screamed. But the dummy had crawled out of its box and was sitting across Jack's chest with its wooden legs around his neck and its clothes peg fingers holding on to the back of his head. Their faces were touching. Run, hissed the dummy. What, said Jack. Get away before it's too late. Why, asked Jack. But the dummy never answered. Mr Frankenstein had wrenched it away and stuffed it back into its coffin. Time for the birthday girl, he declared. Open the door, please, Jack. But what did the dummy mean, asked the small boy. Run from whom? Get away from what? There are one or two questions I'd like answered, Mr Frankenstein, like how could that dummy speak and move on its own? Well, that's a long story. And why did it have a tear in its eye? Well, and why did it have stitches around the base of its neck? If you'll answer's on a postcard, please let me speak. Not listening, Mr Frankenstein, but la 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 la, not listening till I get some answers. Be quiet, roared the entertainer, and Jack was quiet. There was a mad look in Mr Frankenstein's eye, a wild fury that was not to be messed with. For once in your life, listen. It's magic, pure and simple, he said. I came here today because you, the Honourable Jack Delorney de Havilland de Troux, have been chosen by the elders of the Black Circle to receive the knowledge. To make dolls talk, clarified Jack. In a manner of speaking, yes, said the entertainer more calmly. Wow, chuckled Jack. Magic powers. Come secretly to this address tomorrow morning. Come alone, mind and I will pass on to you the ancient wisdom of speaking in other people's tongues. Mr. Frankenstein handed Jack a small white card. This isn't a joke, is it? said Jack, reading the wording. No, said the entertainer. It's a matter of life and death, Jack. Don't disappoint me. Then he composed himself and went to the door. Come on in, children, he announced cheerily. I'm ready for you now. Rosie and her overexcited friends babbled into the room and sat down on the floor. While Mr. Frankenstein locked the door to stop the dummy from escaping, Jack took one last look at the card and popped it into his top pocket. A joke shop in great pessaries, he mumbled. I wonder what it means. The joke shop was in the old lane district of Great Pessaries, narrow medieval streets with overhanging roofs and crooked doors. Jack leant his bike against the grinning clown's face painted on the shop window and pushed open the door. A cackling witch doorbell announced his arrival in the empty shop. Hello, he called out. Mr Frankenstein, it's me, Jack. I've come for my magic lesson. But there was no reply. I'm not scared, he said to himself, looking at the ghoulish masks and plastic severed limbs on the walls. Slowly he edged through the cluttered emporium, past fingers with nails driven through them, past eyeballs dangling from rubber sockets, past rows of ventriloquist dummies hanging lifelessly off meat hooks, like a rack of dead boys in a butcher's shop. Their eyes seemed to follow him as he crept behind the dusty counter and headed for a small door that led out the back. Something touched Jack on the neck. He swung round. Mr Frankenstein? A spider on a piece of elastic bounded up and down on his shoulder. He puffed out his cheeks. You know, I once read a story about a joke shop owner who went mad living with stuff like this, he said out loud. If he kept talking, he was less afraid. The sound of his own voice was comforting. The back door creaked open as he nudged it with his elbow. Mr Frankenstein, uh, I'm here for the magic. I expect you're in the cellar or something preparing a potion for the ceremony, aren't you? The back room was brightly lit. 
by a single naked bulb that cast long shadows across the far wall. Jack laughed uneasily as he glanced to his left and saw two cardboard boxes full of tiny wooden arms and legs. Ooh, this must be where Pinocchio was made, he joshed. Oh, I'd hate to have a wooden body. Think of all those worms living inside you, munching you hollow. And Mr. Frankenstein, where are you? Jack was starting to get scared. He was standing by a third box full of wooden bodies and he could hear a bubbling sound in the corner of the room like a hundred goldfish tanks with oxygen pumps. I'll be off then, he quaked peering round the dusty shells to see where the bubbling was coming from. His heart leapt into his mouth. Stacked against the wall were thirty or more glass tanks of formaldehyde and floating in each tank, suspended by a cat's cradle of wires, was a real boy's head chopped off at the neck. Eyes and mouths closed. The leathery heads bobbed up and down in the mummifying liquid like apples in a barrel. Suddenly, a light was switched on. A bright fluorescent bulb lit up the tanks like a fairground stall and the heads came to life. Eyes blinking, mouths chattering. The room was filled with the underwater bubble talk of thirty boys' voices urging Jack to escape, to run while he still had the legs for it. Jack had seen and heard enough. I'm history, he shouted. See you, Mr. Frankenstein. Looking for me, said a voice from a room to the side of the tanks. Jack froze. Mr. Frankenstein appeared in the cold blue neon light with a half-made ventriloquist dummy in his hands. He was wearing a white apron and half-moon glasses and sewing a leather head onto the stiff wooden body with a needle and thread. Well, chatterbox Jack, he smiled grimly. What do you think of my magic now? Jack's terror set his tongue wagging. Lovely, lovely, very nice. Magic, magic. I've got to get back or I'll miss my bus. But you came on your bike, leered Mr. Frankenstein, laying down the dummy and taking two steps forward. Puncture, stammered Jack, backing away. I got a puncture. I don't know the state of the roads these days. Potholes everywhere. More holes than a golf course. Oh, blimey, is that the time? This is a new watch, you know. My old one had a date, but I preferred the colour of this strap. What do you think? Do you like an axe? Mr Frankenstein had picked up an axe off the counter. I can stop talking if that's what you want, begged Jack. I can sew up my lips. Go on, give me the needle and thread. It won't hurt. Honest, Mr Frankenstein, no! Rosie stood in the garden wearing her black dress. She was rocking backwards and forwards on a loose rock in the path and chanting softly through barely moving lips. My brother Jack, please come back. My brother Jack, please come back. My brother Jack, please come back. She had been there for weeks. Her parents stood at the dining room window watching her sadly. Lord de Troux had his arm around his wife's shoulder. Poor Rezé, murmured Lady de Troux. She just can't accept that he's gone. I bought her a present, said Lord de Troux. A friend, if you like. He broke away to his desk while Lady de Troux shed a silent tear and Rosie's mournful lament drifted across the lawn like smoke from a smouldering bonfire. My brother Jack, please come back. I was uh, passing a joke shop in Great Pessaries, and I remembered how much Rosie had enjoyed that ventriloquist at her party, said Lord de Troux, returning to the window with an oak box shaped like a coffin. Do you think she'll like it? Oh, it's lovely, smiled Lady de Troux, taking the ventriloquist dummy out of the box. You know, she said quizzically, it's got something of Jack in its eyes, don't you think? The dummy blinked. It would have said something too, if its lips hadn't been stitched up. 
Scared. 